Okay, everybody, take your seats. Take your seats. I hope you're having a good way, good week so far. I'm having a good week. Um, today, today we will talk about, or we will start. We will start talking about survey research and about asking questions. And most likely, we will talk more about that next week, next week as well. And eventually, in one of the tutorials, you will actually practice that yourself. Okay, but before let me remind you again, it is seminar week, it is seminar week, you know the drill, you go there, you bring the completed assignment with you, you give it to your tutor, and you participate in the seminar. Okay, so the last time, you know, last time at the end we ran out of time a little bit, so I want to go back and uh, talk a little bit about these two things here again, especially about the second part. Uh, because they are important, they are important, it's reliability and validity. Reliability and validity. Remember, these are basically uh, ways to assess the quality of our measures, right? So how, how good are we in measuring, measuring the concepts and the constructs that we want to measure? And reliability, you know, just as a, a, a to, to capitalize that a little bit, uh, reliability is, is uh, a measure is reliable when you get the same result for an object when you apply it repeatedly. Right? Think of the example: me stepping on my bathroom scale, stepping on it, stepping on it, stepping on it. You all do this. And uh, um, if I do get the same result, then my bathroom scale is reliable. It doesn't mean it's valid, right? Because it can still be off. It can be off. So maybe, maybe this is maybe I tweak my bathroom scale to show me what I want to see, uh, to take off a few pounds, or maybe I don't know. It's just a, a, a badly produced bathroom scale and it adds a few scale, uh, pounds here and there. So that means a measure can be reliable. You get the same thing again, but you keep measuring it. But it doesn't mean that it's valid. Right? So that's sort of the major difference between reliability and validity. We have these three different forms of reliability. I'm not going to go into this again but you also have that in the readings. So let me talk a little bit about validity. Yeah, so validity means a measure is valid when it actually accurately reflects the concept that it is intended to measure. Right? So me stepping on my bathroom scale, it actually gives me my weight. Right? Not just the number that the scale, that the scale comes up with. Right? And when we talk about validity, you know, it actually gets confusing and the more you read about that, uh, it gets more confusing because there are so many different types of validity. Uh, um, here are just a few. So there are three and three I'm going to talk about because I think they are useful. Yeah? But then there are other ones and you can group them slightly differently and so on. It's just really uh, different, different things where you can actually mess this up or how you can actually check whether you are, your measure is actually uh, measuring what you want to measure. Right? So the concept or the construct that you, that you are theoretically interested in. So let me talk about these three, three things here, uh, translational validity, criterion-related validity, and construct validity a little bit more. Okay, so translational validity, basically, you know, there, I don't know, you read about it, you read face validity and content validity. Face validity is basically looking at the measure and thinking, does it make sense, right? I don't know, is this, is this sort of a reasonable, a reasonable measure or maybe it's completely off, right? And uh, often you kind of, Establish face validity by showing your your question or your measure to an expert and then the expert says yes That makes sense or says no, that's completely stupid go home and try again yeah. And we have content validity with content validity. We mean do our measures represent all facets of a given construct Like imagine I don't know you want to you want to know about job satisfaction Right, so that's sort of your construct, and you go out, and you are in the company, you want to run a survey and so on, and ultimately you want to know about job satisfaction. But maybe you're missing out on a really important part, right? That's, um, I don't know, uh, how satisfied people are with um, the holiday arrangements, or something like that, right? Or how satisfied people are with, uh, with their bosses, right? You ask them about other things, about how satisfied they are with their physical work environment or, or other things, but you miss out on certain important aspects of this. Right? And that's sort of um, a valid uh, a measure has high content validity when it actually captures the content of what you, are, what you actually want to, want to get at. 
Okay, so let me, let me move on. Uh, Criterion-related validity. It's one of those things that can be confusing a little bit. Criterion validity basically means, well, first of all, let me talk about what a criterion is or an external criterion. It's basically something that is already established. Yeah? It's sort of an established procedure to measure something. And when you do a survey, it's actually a, a very good idea to do these kind of things, to look at how did other people measure stuff, right? And there are question bearings, and we will come back to that at some point, uh, where actually you can look up the questions, the actual questions that other people used in, uh, in surveys or in other studies, right? So criterion validity would be, uh, a measure that you have is higher criterion validity if it sort of corresponds to what other people with established measures came up with. And there are different versions of this as well. There can be concurrent validity and predictive validity. You don't need to know that. But um, essentially an example would be, uh, I want to measure happiness, and I want to measure this in, a few in as, as few questions as possible. I know people did studies on this. They measured happiness with 50 different questions, and that's sort of a good measure, but I cannot afford to spend 50 questions on that. So I go with my shorter version of it, and then later on I actually check, or I have some, I have, when I test my measure, I actually ask some people the whole 50 questions and my smaller five questions or whatever I have. And then I actually look to do the, the constructs that sort of come out of that or how I, I calculate certain measures based on that. Do they, do they overlap, right? So that would be high on, on, on prepared validity if sort of my new measure sort of matches this established other criterion that other people already have, right? Okay. Construct validity. Construct validity basically means do, uh, do my measure actually reflect the, the constructs that I'm theoretically interested in. And the way we assess construct validity is, remember our constructs is a sort of our building blocks or the concepts are the building blocks of our theories and uh, then we would expect these things to be related with each other somehow, right? That's what a theory is at the end of the day. And with construct validity, we basically mean do our, do our measures or what we measure there, does it behave in relation to the other concept and constructs like we would expect? So the example is, let's say, we come up with a measure for marital satisfaction, you know, like how, how happy are you in, in your marriage, and uh, then we would expect that this sort of relates with marital fidelity, right? Well, I don't know, of course there might be exceptions and so on, but overall, you know, there should be, should be some, theoretically, uh, it would make sense, you know, that people who are happy in their marriage, that they, that they uh, cheat less often on their partner, right? So, and if we wouldn't find that, then we would, uh, something, uh, it's an indication that something would be wrong, something would be wrong with the way we, uh, we might have measured marital satisfaction. Yeah. So that's sort of an example of construct validity. But the really important take home message here is reliability does not imply validity. These two things are different, right? This is sort of how you can remember it, right? You can sort of get the same results, that's sort of what you get on the left, but you're still off target. While in the middle one, you sort of get towards what you want to get, but your measures are sort of off, right? They are all around, not very precise. Ultimately, we want to have, we want to have both. We want to have valid and reliable measures. Okay, so that's sort of just uh, following up on, on last, last time when we talked about reliability and validity. So now let me get started with the actual topic for today. You know, as I said, this is going to stay with us for a little, for a little more. So next Monday we will return to that, and uh, there actually we will have a much more practical hands-on session on that. Okay, so what I'm going to do today as well, I'm going to run another experiment with you guys. Yeah? And uh, there you actually see how, how experiment designs, how actually why research designs and methods are not the same, because now I'm actually going to use an experiment design within the context of the survey. Right? So you guys will fill out a questionnaire. And, but the whole thing is an experimental design. If it does work out, it's another one of those magic tricks that I have up my sleeves. Yeah. If it doesn't, let's see, I don't know, you'll see, I have tested this. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm looking forward to see if this works. The way this works, what we're going to do now. Right? So this is sort of the lecture theater, here we are. We're going to, buy, to divide this lecture theater here in the middle. Right? If you are in the middle, you decide whether you want to go to this side or whether you want to go to this side. The people on this side over here, uh, you belong into the dark group, and you guys will answer the questions at this side of the screen. 
you guys over here, you belong to the white group. And you will answer the questions on the white side of the screen, right? And I said, so sort of here is a distinction. If you're in the middle, it doesn't really matter. Choose one or the other direction. So take out your phones. Take out your computers. Okay, so the first question is really just to get you started. And what you will see now is uh, you will be prompted other questions. So please continue, please continue answering the other questions that you will see. I will not display them right now on the screen. We'll come back to them later on. So this first question is really just to get you started and to have you have you gone into the one route or into, into the other route? Another thing that you see right now is now I'm not displaying the absolute votes here. Now I'm actually showing percentages, right? So we can actually compare things with each other. That's going to be going to be the key the key in this little exercise. Okay, so is working out with the other questions? Another four or five questions that you guys. Filling out, yes, working out. Okay, excellent, perfect. Uh, interesting that we have twice as many people in the white group than in the black group, but <laughs> doesn't doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter. We will come back to that in uh, during this lecture, and you will see what actually happened. Because actually, what I did now, I actually uh, rerouted things and I asked you things slightly different, slightly different, marginally different, marginally differently, and you will see if it actually works out as I, as I suspect. Uh, you will see tremendous differences in the responses, just as a consequence of tiny little wording changes that I make. Okay, so let's get started with uh, surveys and questionnaires. So that's actually what I'm going to do first. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are surveys, you know, um, and very broadly, I'm going to talk about open and closed questions, general stuff about surveys and questionnaires, and we will have more about that um, next week as well. And then I will. What I want to do today, I want to make you, I want to make you aware. I want to make you aware of certain issues about questionnaires and surveys that you might not have thought about. That's all about the, what the point of, of this lecture here today is, and also you know where this little survey experiment comes into play, where where you where you hopefully realize then that running a survey and asking questions actually is actually not that straightforward and simple as you as you might think, right? So we have this, we had this a bunch of times here already, and that some things just seem to be so straightforward, you know, how do we know something, how do we explain something, and at the end, you know, you realize, hang on a moment, we actually should think about these kind of things a little bit. Yeah. So that's sort of, I have four things that I want to talk about here, question wording, question ordering, then answer categories, and social desirability. Okay, let's get started with surveys first. Um, as a reminder, where are we? You know, we're still sort of in this planning phase. We have our research design, thinking about uh, cross-sectional, longitudinal, experimental, and things like that. Operationalization, that's sort of what we did uh, on Monday. And now we're sort of more into this method part here. So now we're zooming in, and there will be more, more ways of collecting data. So running a survey is just one of them, right? There could be, I don't know, you could have interviews, you can have participant observations, you can do documentary research. We can do secondary analysis, all sorts of things that we will come back and that we will now spend on most of our time for the for the rest of the of the semester.
Okay, so you learn all sorts of all sorts of useful things in this course. I hope. Yeah, I hope you learn all sorts of useful things in this course. Um, one very useful thing to know, I think, is not to make this one, but uh, how to how to actually <laughs> ask questions. How to ask questions. And while I was preparing for this, I noticed actually, you know, that we should have a whole session on this. So on Monday, on Monday, it's going to be very much a hands-on session where I talk you through about the do's and don'ts about asking when you ask questions. And actually, we're going to have a questionnaire and we're going to rip it apart and you will see all the different things one can do wrong and how one should remedy it. Right, so that's sort of what we're going to do on, on Monday. We will follow up on that. But today, I want to make you aware of certain, certain issues that we have when, uh, when, we, when we ask people questions. Okay, so first of all, a survey, just to get the definition right here, a survey consists of a predetermined set of questions that are given to a sample of people. A self-administered questionnaire is a set of questions that people answer by themselves. Right? So basically, what I've been doing with you guys here all the time, that's sort of, these are mini surveys. Now, I run mini surveys with you twice a week, you know, kind of you tip in something, I have certain questions, and, uh, and uh, you type in something and I get some answers. Then we distinguish also between a self-administered questionnaire, that's sort of something where people actually fill it out by themselves, right? The other one, and that's sort of, you know, historically people actually used to do, or actually nowadays some people still do that, uh, the, 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 um, the opposite to that is the structured interview, where actually somebody, somebody sits down with you, asks you a question, and this person is essentially filling out the questionnaire. So that's sort of um, the structured interview approach. And you see already there are some differences, right? For example, I don't know, when, when I give you a, a questionnaire, I'm not entirely sure who fills it out, right? While when I'm filling it out, I actually am sitting opposite to you, and I actually, you know, you tell me something and I fill it out, then I have more control about that. But it also introduces some other biases here, not even to speak of the practicalities of the whole thing, of it being more expensive and whatnot. Okay, so essentially, you know, a survey or, or, or questionnaires, that's what we have all the time here. You know, I'm just thinking here at the weekend, thinking about stuff I can ask you. Right. Okay, I'm just like, okay, how can I bring home this point? How can I nail this down? Uh, I run a quiz with you guys, right? I ask you something, you basically fill it out, you return it, you press the submit button, you know, that's sort of how it nowadays works. I have the data, we talk about it, that's a survey. <laughs> Historically, traditionally, um, People used to distinguish how we um, would administer a survey, right? Back in the old days, you know, it was sort of the thing to do, to walk around your city, you were busy for a year or two, to collect, knock at people's doors and so on and ask them stuff. Then at some point, you know, um, it's actually funny when you read these books on research methods and designs. You know, I read all different books and ah, at some point, maybe I just have to write one myself. But, um, you know, those books, some of them are old, and the guys who, who wrote it are even older, and then they tell, you, they tell you that this new thing, this new thing is now that you can actually send a questionnaire by mail to somebody, right? This is a new thing. And then at the end, they kind of, they move on and say, oh, but there are also these fancy things that you can actually call people. Call senders a few years back. I remember when I was a student, uh, universities went all crazy on that, or universities thought now they need to have a telephone laboratory, you know, where they had basically, 20 different telephones standing next to each other, and they hired students to make phone calls and collect data like that. Nowadays, you know, these, I don't know, these rooms are just sitting there, and nobody uses this stuff anymore. You know, the world is changing. You see it here. Uh, there's a thing like the internet now, you know. Uh, people use it. Actually, um, it solves a whole bunch of problems. Um, data is already eventually there. And uh, funnily, you know, in these books, it's those sort of the last end here, right? I, I can guarantee you by the time that you guys finish, uh, there, there will hardly be any other forms of, uh, of running surveys anymore. If I run surveys, even when I run it with people like you, I'm standing in front of you, I'm using the internet, right? I'm using the internet to get that, to collect the stuff. It just makes our life much, much easier. Yeah. So things are changing here, things are changing here, and I'm sometimes fascinated by how those, you know, but you have to give it to them. Those guys, you know, they are in the business for 30, 40 years and they kind of have been doing things the old way and, uh, and uh, here we are. Okay, let me first talk a little bit about some advantages and some disadvantages of running surveys. And we will come back to this kind of thing or we will have this discussion with uh, the different methods that we will talk about during this class over, over the semester as well. Well, first of all, Running a survey is relatively cheap to administer. 
but actually for me, it's even cheap to set up. You know, the practical part, I sit there on a Saturday, Sunday evening, uh, and okay, let's, let's put on down the question, what I'm going to ask you. It's, it's, it's done very quickly. Uh, I just send it out to you, there's this thing. Actually, I don't even have to write this stuff. I'm using, I'm using, I'm using tools. And that's another thing I want to talk with you about on, on Monday, about the tools that are out there to, to run service. And you already saw one. You know, remember the stuff with the cow? There you went, uh, there I actually had used SurveyMonkey. It's one of those platforms that you can use to run surveys and to have the data afterwards. Right? The quick to administ uh, administer. Now oh, I just give you a link or I can send out an email and so on. I don't have to sit there and stamp 500 envelopes. Yeah? Would be a nightmare to ask the kinds of questions here that I'm asking here in, a, in an old traditional, traditional format. It's easy for the respondents. Now you guys know it best. You take out your phone, bang, there you are, submit. So uh, uh, it's easy to analyze. It has some other advantages. It's also this thing of an interviewer effect. There's no interviewer effect. We will talk more about that when we actually talk about uh, interviews and, and unstructured interviews. Interview effect basically means that the person who's asking you the question has an impact on what you're going to, how you're going to answer the question. And sometimes this happens in a very unconscious way. Right? Or sometimes it even matters whether the interviewer is male or female. Right? You will get different answers from the same kind of people. That's what we call an interviewer effect or an interview effect. Okay, what are some disadvantages of running these kind of surveys and using questionnaires? Well, um, in this setting here, I can respond to you guys having problems with the questions, but imagine that uh, you send out emails to the whole student body of UCD, yeah, which is what you can try, <laughs> and see how it works. Uh, and then uh, those guys don't understand your question, uh, you cannot really react to it. Right? You cannot really help them to figure out what was meant by, by that and so on. Uh, so that can be a problem that it's, it can be sometimes not clear or actually that's the reason why when we ask questions we need to be very clear. And that's sort of a big mistake that you can make being unclear. You know, I'm telling you to be clear about a lot of things or many things in life, especially when you uh, ask questions. So especially when you, when you design a survey. Because if you ask a, a question that is unclear, well, people don't really understand the question and then you don't really uh, know what they what the, uh, what the answer actually means. A last point that we have when we run surveys like this, um, maybe as a researcher, I just don't know the right questions yet. Right? Maybe, um, I don't know, I'm interested in how you guys uh, spend either your free time or I don't know, what are your attitudes towards uh, the internet or things like that. But maybe I just can't imagine the things that you guys care about in that particular uh, um, topic. Right? So in that case, uh, um, a structured interview like that uh, can, be, can be problematic because it limits people to certain, certain questions. Right? So I, I administer those questions. They are predetermined. And then maybe these questions don't, don't, cut the, uh, uh, don't, don't come to the point. Maybe they don't get to the things that are actually um, important or that actually matter to, to, to the, for the thing that you are theoretically interested in, right? So that's one of the downsides. But on the other side, you know, there are many, many advantages of that. And actually, I'm a big fan of surveys. You know, I'm, I'm running it twice a week here with you guys. But I also think it's a, it's a, it's a very useful tool uh, as long as you know uh, what you're doing. Yeah. Okay, so one problem when you run a survey, when we run a survey, you know, you have I don't know, maybe you set it up with your website, you send out email links, or maybe you do it old school, and you, uh, you print it out and you mail it, or you, uh, you, you hassle down people and you, uh, you give them a questionnaire. Um, one of the problems is that sometimes just people just don't care. Yeah? And you guys most likely um, experience that yourselves. How many times did you have a weird questionnaire from a weird company in your mailbox and you just said, I just can't. Give a fuck, yeah. So, um, uh, so that can that can happen, and these questionnaires they end up in the bin, yeah. So that's sort of um, a common common problem, a common problem, and uh, we actually that's sort of where response rate comes into play. With response rate, we mean basically the percentage of number of people who who actually got the questionnaire, who actually completed it, right? So 
I see, you know, on our, our weekly quizzes or something like that, I have around 170, 180 people who actually type in. If I would now count how many people are sitting here, I divide the two numbers by each other. Maybe I get, I don't know, maybe I get 70% um, or something like that, which is, which is high, I would say, yeah, which is very high. But um, unless you are, unless you are in, a, in, a, in another regime, uh, in, uh, in another country, um, your response rate is almost never going to be 100%. You know? um, why is that, why should we care about response rates? You know, why are low response rates, why can they be problematic? Well, actually studies show that actually they are less problematic than we thought they are. They are problematic, or it, it is problematic when only a, a certain percentage of people actually respond, fill out your questionnaire, when this happens in a systematic way, right? When, when a certain kind of people don't fill out the questionnaire. Because then those people are not represented in your, in your, in your survey, right? Those people are out of your data set. So an example here, and I'm completely aware of this, so for example, we know, we know that, I don't know, the use of internet or mobile phones is related to age. We know that. So maybe my little quizzes systematically leaves out older students. That sort of would be a problem, a problem if this would be a real survey, right? That then kind of, you know, we would have to do something about that. You know? um, we would have to, I don't know, make sure or we need to know about is this systematic or not? And, you know, there are ways to test this. I could test this. I, for example, you know, remember, I asked you in one of the surveys I had, I asked you age. I could go into the university roster. I have that data. You know, I can look it up. Uh, who is registered for this course. I look at the age distribution there. I look at the age, age distribution in my in the little survey that I handed out to you, I see if I'm systematically off or not. Right. And when you are systematically <laughs> off, there are then ways you can weight stuff, but that's sort of for, for another day to talk about. Basically, you could give certain people a higher weight than, than others yeah, to, to outbalance these uh, systematic errors that you introduce. Okay, what can we do to increase response rates? Well, a lot of it is sort of, uh, um, Pretty straightforward, you know, write a good cover letter, uh, issue reminders, have short questionnaires. The longer the questionnaires are, the, the quicker people are being fed up with it. Uh, the more complicated these things are, the quicker they are fed up with it. Um, sometimes actually people even provide monetary incentives for that. However, sometimes studies show that actually when you provide people monetary incentives, the response rate goes down. Right? So that's, that can happen as well, and people think now uh, they are kind of providing information to a big company and they are paying, why should they benefit from my data? Well, if they just do it on a voluntary basis, you can go the other way around as well. So there are certain ways to do that, but the important thing to remember here is, uh, we will talk more about that in one of the next sessions, we'll talk about sampling. Is this systematic, right? Is this sort of, uh, are certain people with certain attributes more more likely to miss out than, than others. Okay, so that's sort of a, a, a general intro to surveys and questionnaires. Now I'm going to tap a little bit into two different types of questions, right? And then we get more into, into detail and then we will talk about these four, four things that you might not have thought about uh, when we talk about questions and uh, um, coming back to the little, the little quiz that we had at the beginning. Okay, first we have open-ended and closed-ended questions. Yeah. What are these things? Just to make it clear, well, this is an open-ended question, right? This is, remember, that's one of the first, one of the first questions that I asked you guys. And there you really see uh, the problems that you can have with <laughs> open-ended question. You get some very interesting things, things that, things that I never thought about that you guys care about, right? Uh, for example, whether I prefer Matt Damon or Ben Affleck, right? Seriously, who likes Ben Affleck? Other things, you know, um, uh, it can be very useful in an exploratory way, right? I can actually uh, uh, see other things that I didn't think about in the first instance, but you guys brought it up, right? Something that seems to, seems to matter for you, right? I don't know, I should change the microphone or things like that. So this is an, open, this is an open-ended question. And you already see some, some advantages and some disadvantages of that. So advantages are, you know, respondents are not forced to pick a category, you know, but can choose their own words. That can actually help. Uh, you can get some unexpected, unanticipated answers, right? Things that I never thought about. <laughs> Still puzzled by it. And um, 
questions do not suggest a certain kind of answer. That's something we will come back later on, because as soon as you introduce answer categories, people tend to use that information to, to, to think about uh, what they're going to answer. Right? So there's sort of a, a weird feedback loop here, that with answer categories, you're sometimes suggesting, you're sometimes suggesting something that then people will, will pick up, and something uh, that people would not have said otherwise if you would have had another answer category. And actually, one of the little exercises that we had that I did, it was exactly about that. Where I gave one guys, uh, those guys over here, exactly the same question, but with different answer categories, and those guys over here, exactly the same question, but with different answer categories. Okay, but they can be still useful to generate stuff. Some disadvantages, um, you know, they are time consuming for respondents, you have to type something in. Um, actually, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare to deal with that data afterwards. You know, I have 500 respondents about people asking about my beard. Uh, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> actually, I printed it out and showed it to my colleagues. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it is in the sociology department, guys. Um, many, um, it's an effort required. So, but, but the, and, uh, coding this stuff and analyzing this stuff can be, can be problematic. What is a closed question? Well, this is a closed question. This is actually not a, this is a really bad closed question, actually, yeah? because of the answer categories. It's one of those questions that I ask you as well. But here I gave you answer categories, right? Gave you answer categories that were mutually exclusive. You had to choose the one or the other. This is a bad question because, you know, uh, they are uh, suggestive. You know, I'm using a couple of letters here. Yes, dude. The second one, no, crank up the volume. I add some additional information that shouldn't be there, right? And, and the last one, what the hell is this answer category anyway? Right? What the hell is that for? Right? Not only to speak of the hell, which is the problem here, using the word hell, but then also having a question in the answer, that's just bad stuff. That's just, I don't know, that's just for the, for the fun of it. Yeah. That's just to entertain you guys. Okay, so close questions, they are quicker and easier to complete. Yeah. You have uh, higher response rates, right? I have more people ticking uh, a box than writing something. It's easier to process afterwards. Actually, I can compare the data later on afterwards as well. Disadvantages, well, you only get what you ask. You only get uh, uh, the answer categories that you provide. Right? You are limited in the range that you have. Uh, maybe as a researcher, I just don't know all the possible answers yet. Right? And what we often have, sometimes we have sort of an exploratory phase where you go out and you kind of have a more open-ended question and then you use that information that you get to have a more specific closed question afterwards. Right? So that's sort of often how the, how, the, how the process works. Okay, so that was sort of the general introduction to uh, surveys in questionnaires and it will stay with us. Uh, it is important, you know, I think it's actually pretty cool and uh, it's, it's a way to generate uh, very interesting data very quickly and practically in your life when you end up in a company or somewhere, this is what you're going to do. This is your bread and butter. This is sort of what gives you a job as a social scientist. That you need. Okay, so now I want to talk about four things about asking questions and surveys that you might not have thought about, that you might not have thought about before and uh, let's see, they can be very surprising and how they actually matter. The first one is question, question wording, question wording. So what we know, what we know is that even small changes, even small changes in questions can, uh, can make a big, a big, big difference. So now let's see if we get this going. Okay, here we are. So that was sort of the, the thing. And now I want to go to one question. Ah, brilliant. Brilliant. Do you see that? So basically I asked you guys the question, what are charges in Ireland are, in the first case, 160 euros per year for one adult? This is too much. In the second case I asked, those guys over here I asked, what are charges in Ireland are 13.30 euros per month? Notice, it's exactly the same amount. It's 160 euros divided by 12. That's 13.30. It's exactly the same amount. Look at the answers. Isn't that beautiful? Because now you see that actually in the case where we had lower numbers, people shifted, people shifted towards the not disagree part. It's a smaller number. Right? You just read the smaller number, you read 30.30. Well, in the other case, you guys read 160. 160 sounds bigger than 30.30. Well, in fact, essentially it's exactly the same money that you pay for your water charges. 
It's exactly the same money that you pay for the water charger, but you see how it shifts into the one direction, right? If I would add this up, you know, if I have sort of the, the strongly agree in the agree category, uh, the white group, it was sort of 64% uh, in that group, while in the black group, in the dark group, you no, know, we, we are talking about uh, 34, 44%. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. So that's my first magic trick that I'm showing to you today. There are going to be a few other ones like that. But you see a tiny, tiny difference in the wording. Had a big difference, 20% different percentage difference, whether you actually said strongly agree or agree to whether uh, the water charges are too high. Just by me using a larger number compared to the smaller number on the monthly basis and compared to the larger number on the yearly basis but it's exactly the same amount when you calculate it. Always happy when these things work out. You, know, you never know, you never know. I have some ideas about whether it's going to work out, but and then you actually see it does work out. Uh, I have an example where, where um, you know, this was sort of back in the days when the US, they thought about should we, should we invade in Iraq? You know, there was, oh God, maybe you guys weren't born at the time. Uh, it's a while back. So they had a survey and they asked Americans, um, do you favor or oppose taking military action in Iraq to end Saddam Hussein's rule? Right? That was at the time when the guy was still alive. He was a dictator. And 68% and, um, of the people said they favored military action. 68%. Then they asked exactly the same question to the same kind of people, but now they asked, do you favor or oppose taking military action in Iraq to end Saddam Hussein's rule, even if it meant that US forces might suffer thousands of casualties? <coughs> See, it's the same, it gets to the same point. Do people agree with, uh, with sending in troops into Iraq? And now you see, sort of at the same time frame, only 43% of the people said, yes, they agree. Right. Actually, I just demonstrated you the same kind of effect. Even, actually, I think in my case, it was, uh, was even more convincing because there was a number in both cases, right? In the one case, the number was just larger than in the other one, although it reflected the same, the same water charges that you guys have to have to pay. Okay, so even small changes in wording can make big differences. What do we do about this? No. Well, the first thing is to know that. First thing is to know that. If, if many people don't know that. They just go and they ask their question and there they are, right? First thing is you need to know, you need to be aware of, does this matter in my case, right? And then you actually go, when you, when you design your questions and you think about your questions, you actually play these things out. Now we have a pilot test, we have a pilot test, and that's what you guys are going to do in the seminar, not this week, but in, in two weeks. Uh, you have a we have a pilot test where people actually, you know, you see how do people respond to different wordings, you know what, so that you get a feel for it. And that you know, am I going to introduce a bias here in a certain way? Or um, what actually is the effect of my wording? Another thing that you can do, and that's another thing that I want to talk about with you on, on Monday, is you can use existing questions, right? And they're sort of... There are big databases out there, well, there are lots of studies, folks like me, I don't know, government-funded projects and so on. They actually have to deposit their data and they deposit their surveys, their questionnaires as well. Right? So then you can use, okay, let's, uh, let's use the question that they use in the census in Ireland, or let's use exactly the same question they use in the British Household Panel Survey, because we know this is an established question. Right? So using existing questions is actually a very clever way to uh, not reinvent the wheel and introduce potential potential mess ups, you know, like I just like I just showed you, or where you don't really know what it actually means. So use some questions that other people already thought about. Okay, so question wording that was sort of my first magic trick. Now let me try the same thing with question ordering. Question ordering. What do we mean by question ordering? It's basically the sequence. It's basically the sequence in which questions are being asked. It's exactly the same question, but sort of a different sequence. So now let me go back and see how we look on that front. Okay, I think it did work out. It did work out to some degree. We have a little more variation here, but yeah, no, actually it did work out. So again, you sort of see the, the black group. The, I asked you the question, water charges in Ireland are fair. Do you? And then I had the same, the same question, 
The same answer categories, strongly agree, agree, not agree, disagree, disagree, or strongly disagree. The same thing. What was the difference here? What was the difference? The black group, I asked you the question about the Irish government should spend more money on education and schools right before I asked you the question about water junctions. While in the other group, the white group, I asked you this question afterwards. What did I do here? I primed you. I prim well, that's a psychological term, priming, or we always call it halo effect. Um, I made you, those guys where I asked the question about um, education and, and school spending first, I kind of primed you in a certain way to think about, yes, the Irish government, we need to spend money. We need to spend money, universities, they need to have money to have great lectures, you know, and uh, to have great people. We need to invest money. That's just how it goes. Universities should spend on schools. What happens in your brain? Well, this sort of you remember here a little bit. You, you, you notice, okay, well, we need to get the money somewhere, right? And then I ask you the question about water charts. And then you are actually less likely to, uh, to agree that this is sort of, uh, um, th then you're actually more likely to say that water charts are fair. Because I just, I don't know, put you in an emotional state and a cognitive state where you're thinking about um, uh, government spending, money needs to come from somewhere. While in the other group, I didn't do that. I asked you the question about uh, university and school funding after I asked you the question about uh, whether water charge an island off here. Again, you see how this actually works out. So the same question, the same question, the same answer categories, but I had the wording, I had the order slightly differently, and bang, we get different results. And that's, if you, uh, let's go back to this. When you sometimes wonder, okay, um, here's an example here. Um, sometimes, you know, TV channels, uh, they have these, um, these polls, right? This is sort of now a poll back in the days, 2009, Obamacare, that was sort of the health, introducing health care uh, action in, uh, in the US, right? They didn't have a proper health care system before, and then kind of, you know, they were suggested, Democrats suggested to have a new health care system. And then you have these different TV channels, and they run polls, you know, they ask people, and you know, there's Fox News. Fox News is actually you know, they're known to be uh, biased towards Republicans. And this is sort of what you see. So uh, they ask them about general approval, or are they, are they in favor or against Obamacare? You know, and, and people who, who, who did the, the, the survey from Fox News, you know, they were 33% in favor of it, while at the same time, you know, average polls, sort of uh, people were much higher. They were 43% in favor of it. Right? So you wonder. How did, that, how did they do that, right? How does it actually happen that there's a news channel biasing result, a survey result? These are sort of real people, answer categories, and so on. Well, keep in mind what you just saw. Uh, this is actually how it goes. Um, so you could think, first of all, okay, maybe, maybe those guys who kind of uh, do the, the, the survey with Fox News, maybe they just don't like uh, um, Democrats, right? They just, just, just kick as Republicans, and they just would hate everything the Democrats do. But in the same survey, in the same survey, you know, this is sort of approval rates for President Obama, and there you see, no, that was not the case. Actually, the folks who did the, the survey with, uh, with, uh, with Fox News, they even had a slightly higher approval of the president. How did they do that? How did they bias, or I don't know, what is sort of, how could we explain this difference of 33 to 43% here? Okay, so now let's jump into the actual question. This is sort of the actual question that they asked people said, based on what you know about the healthcare reform legislation being considered right now, do you favor or oppose the plan? Is there any bias in this question? I don't see any. I don't see any, maybe some things you could ask slightly differently, but there is not, not a real bias in a certain question. You know, when they probe something like, I don't know, Obamacare is that, yeah. Uh, say no, this is, this, is, this is stupid, or where they say, uh, where they mention the um, all the things that follow from that that have negative implications. I don't see any bias here. I don't see any bias here. The solution, the solution is in the question order. The solution is in the question order. In the Fox poll, in the survey that they did with, with, with Fox News Channel, these are sort of some of the questions that they asked before. These are some of the questions they asked right before they asked people about Obamacare, about the healthcare legislation, right? So they asked questions like, um, do you think President Obama apologizes too much to the rest of the world for past US policies? 
Or do you think uh, um, the Obama administration is proposing more government spending than American taxpayers can afford or not? Do you think the size of the national debt is so large it is hurting the future of the country? So these are sort of all kick-ass Republican questions where sort of they push you into a certain way, a bit like I did with my, with my sum about the water, charge, water charges, where they put you in a certain way, you think, okay, oh, the government is bad. Yeah. They suck. Well, you could wonder why didn't they, why wasn't the, the president's approval rating affected by that? Well, because it was the very first question. It was the very first question, then they answered these kind of Republican kick-ass questions, and then they went into asking the question about health care, and here we are, pedophile, how it came about that the question order mattered. So we call this question order effect, or it's also called halo effect. Yeah? If you get the reference, you do, if you don't, you don't. Uh, the way um, halo effect is uh, it's a psychological cognitive thing as well that matters greatly for surveys. And actually, I think it's a fascinating thing for research to actually study these kinds of things. Right? You see, this is actually pretty cool stuff. Um, uh, it's about how a person reacts to something can be heavily influenced by what they have been exposed to recently. Yeah. Just like I did with the question ordering, where I gave some of you guys the question first and others I gave a question afterwards. What can we do about that? Well, you can. First of all, be aware of that. Then you can, um, you can order your questions in a certain way. Have opinion questions before, before behavior questions. Because behavior questions, people, people aren't going to change. Right? They just think back about, okay, what did I do last week? It's not something that kind of is going to be affected by that. While opinion questions are more likely to be affected by the ordering of questions. So it's good to have them first and uh, the other behavior questions afterwards. Second important thing is separate out topics under certain pages. Right? Because if you, have, if you ask President approval or Iraq war and then Obamacare at the same page, people will have this priming. People will kind of have this. But if you have a physical page that they need to push over, you, 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 you can reduce this effect. Or lastly, you can actually randomize the order of questions. And nowadays, you know, when we run questions, questions online, you can, you can do that very easily. Okay, let me get to the, to the, thir to the third thing, and uh, maybe the fourth one I leave for, for, for Monday, but the answer categories, they are pretty cool as well, and I want to, I want to have that. Yeah. So, let's go back to my third magic trick. Let's see if I hit three today. Um, brilliant, 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 brilliant. You see exactly the same question. It's exactly the same question. How much time do you spend on Facebook per day? How much time do you spend on Facebook per day? Now the only difference is the answer categories. Look at the answer categories. Uh, in the black, uh, the dark group, you know, let's look at the last category. There are more than 90%, that's sort of 29% of the people said that they spend more than, more than 90 minutes per day on Facebook. Now let's look at the, at the corresponding categories for the, for the white group. Here, the group up to 90% is actually at the very left, right? You see, I, have it, I had it spread out much more, I had it spread out much more, and in order to, to look at how many people spend 90 minutes or, or more on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on Facebook, I would actually have to add up everything, everything that is on the right of the red bar, right? So, and if I, if I would do that, if I would do that, you know, I have 20, then I have uh, 31, I have uh, uh, 70, 73, I have 39 people. So in the white question, if I would just look at who, spent more than, who spends more than 90 minutes per day on Facebook, 39% of the people said yes, they spend more than 90 minutes on Facebook. While for the black group, it was only 29%. Unless you can tell me any, any reason, any reason why this side of the, of, of the room should spend less time on Facebook than that side of the room, this is an effect of the answer categories. So again, you kind of see how this actually can play out. Now we're talking about, again, it's sort of a big difference, 29 compared to 39. So that's not, I'm, I'm confident this is not a fluke, yeah, and, uh, and that's sort of something that, um, that uh, the people found in, in other studies as well. Okay, so there is also there is this. How, how did that happen? How did that happen? Well, first of all, there is a tendency towards the middle category. We know that people tend to tick the box in the middle. Why do they do that? Well, first of all, they wrongly think they wrongly think that 
the answer categories give them some information about the real distribution. So most likely when you were in the white group, you thought, okay, maybe the average person spends 180 minutes on Facebook per day, because that was sort of the middle category. But that's just something that I made up. That's just something that I made up to trick you into this thing. That you thought this is sort of the average, and then you kind of adjusted your own response, because it's, I don't know how much time you spend on Facebook. It's not really clear how do you do that. But you thought, okay, I'm a little, a little less than the average, maybe, or a little more than the average, and so on. And that's sort of what happens here. The second thing that can happen is that when you have a lot of questions, people get tired to go to the extreme. It just really takes more time to go to the other ends, right? So they just stay in the middle. It's a particular problem when you have matrix of questions. And, uh, and the third one is that people might have expectations about additional questions that come later on, and so they want to leave room for, for other things. So what can you do about it? Well, we can create scales with more points, we can give respondents appropriate anchors, and so on. Well, um, next week I'm going to talk more about this dude again. So he, he, he comes back, he comes back, and uh, social desirability. But um, for Monday, there is no reading. We will follow up on these kind of things, and I will show you more practical how to guide, and we will have a session on how, what to do and what not to do. Thanks very much. <laughs>